The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. Welcome to a wild ride on Formed. Uh, we're going to discuss Gilbert Keith Chesterton's Orthodoxy. And it'll be a wide, wild run on a chariot going down through history, you know, which we'll get to that in the middle of the book. Um, I, I want to have Joseph, who's actually written a book or books on Chesterton, to kind of lead the discussion. But I want to discuss a preliminary problem. Often we make we quote from a book, right? H how do we limit ourselves? <laughs> In this book, because Chesterton is so quotable. I mean, almost every paragraph he's got something to quote, right? So I don't know how we're going to handle it, but Joseph, you take the lead and tell us what you want to do. Well, yeah, you, you, you presented me with the conundrum. Obviously, Father, you and I, for a, a, a two or three years now, have taught at Arbe Muir University a, a course on Chesterton where um, you know we teach orthodoxy and the Man of Thursday side by side. Um, uh, and so we, you know, we've obviously taught this many times, and you're completely correct. I mean, I, I've got highlighting on every single page. So I don't know whether we just want to try to, I know, just skip to the next par next chapter if we if we haven't, or whether we want to take six months on it. I mean, I I, <laughs> I don't really mind, quite frankly, one way or the other. But we can either either pace ourselves. So there are there are nine chapters uh, uh plus the preface and the, and, the, and, the, and the note on the text um uh so we can either maybe try try to keep to one chapter per week or we can just let it play it by ear and ramble well, you're in charge so if we would like you to give a little introductory presentation on who Chesterton was and where this book comes in his corpus and so on yeah, so yeah, we'll begin with a few uh, introductory words about Chesterton himself. Most Catholics, I'm sure, uh, at least most on fire active Catholics will know the name Chesterton because his name crops up all, all the time, but they might not necessarily know too much about him. So I'm going to give a few bare bones facts and then maybe a little bit about where orthodoxy fits into the, that and then we'll get then we'll get going. So Chesterton was born in 1874 and died in 1936. He was first published in 1900, so the, the, his corpus, his body of work, spanned from the, the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, 1900, until his death in 1936. Um, so the first third and a little bit more of the 20th century. So he was a man of letters, which means he, he, he's not going to be pigeonholed uh, in any one particular box. Uh, See, so he, he was a novelist, uh, but not just a novelist, he was an essayist. He was a poet. Uh, he was a, 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 a writer of biographies, a writer of histories, or the history of England. Um, uh, and, um, of course, he was a Catholic apologist. And this is his first great works of Catholic, first great work of Catholic apologetics. And I, ironically, it's uh, um, 14 years before he himself becomes a Catholic. Um, but, you know, people reading this book, this book is a book which is Orthodox, not with a capital O as in, as in Eastern Orthodox, but Orthodox as in Catholic doctrine. Um, uh, and Chesterton was a Catholic for many years before he formalized the relationship by being received into the church. And the main reason for that delay was his uh, uh, love for his wife, Frances, who was a very comfortable Anglican, who was very happy going to Anglican church every Sunday. And Chesterton waited patiently for her. And in the end, it was the only thing he ever did in his marriage separate from his wife. In the end, his conscience would not allow him to, to delay any longer. And he entered the church without her. Um, and thankfully, and, and thanks be to God, uh, about two years later, she also entered the church. And then they spent a decade or so or, or more, uh, both uh, as, as Catholics. So Chesterton said he's a giant in all sorts of ways, uh, you know, as a poet, as an essayist uh, uh, and as a, a Catholic apologist. And this, along with The Everlasting Man, I would say it was two major works of uh, of Catholic apologetics. So I'm delighted and excited that we can uh, take the world chariot ride, as Father said, uh, by reading this book together. Good. You, you mentioned all the 
a man of letters, you know, essayist and so on, literary criticism as well, of course. Uh, but he was also, I mean, everything he writes is permeated by a philosophy of life, a world vision, and a theology uh, that you wouldn't call him a philosopher or a theologian, except for the fact that uh, he has this co-natural knowledge of philosophy and theology. And just one little anecdote here, uh, he did a biography of Thomas Aquinas. And I know one of the students who was a graduate student at St. Michael's College in, uh, wherever it is, in Canada somewhere, uh, who was a student of Etienne Gilson. And Gilson, Etienne Gilson and Jacques Maritain were the two great Thomist philosophers and writers of the mid 20th century. In France. In the world. Oh, in the world too. Oh, yes, in the world, entire world. Uh, and it was rumored that Chesson was going to write a book on Thomas Aquinas. And so it finally came out and it, it came in the mail and the students gave it to H.N. Jesson, took it home. And the next day, they went, what's he going to say? And this is a first-hand account I've got, okay? Wow. Second-hand from me, but I'm a first-hand person I got it from. Ken Schmitz was his name. Chesson came into the room. He threw the book against the wall. And he said, I've been studying and writing on Chesson all my life. I could not have written a book as good as this. I mean, he's been studying Thomas. Thomas, yeah. What did I say, Chesson? Yeah. yeah so I said, Thomas Aquinas, yeah. Oh, thank you for the correction. Yeah, it was just, uh, you know, but, but that was, Chesson wow. was intuitive. I mean, he didn't read all of Thomas Aquinas. He couldn't have. But he only had to read a few paragraphs here and there to somehow grasp what the philosophy was, you know. Well, the other yeah. anecdote about it, Father, Following one from that, from what you just said about not reading all of Thomas. I mean, who has? Quite frankly, I'm sure some people have, but uh, most certainly haven't. Um, that apparently, when he was commissioned to write the biography of uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, and he was commissioned because he's, he, he was commissioned earlier to write a biography of St. Francis of Assisi, which is not, it's an easier prospect, <laughs> and, was, and was hugely successful. His biography of, uh, of Francis of Assisi was one of his most successful and best selling books. So the publisher was keen to follow up with, with, with a book on Aquinas. And he asked his secretary, Dorothy Collins, to go to the library and bring back every book they had on Aquinas or by Aquinas. She came back with a pile of books like this. And apparently Chesterton spent about 15 or 20 minutes sort of browsing through a few of them, put the whole whole pile to one side and didn't consult them again at all as he as he basically then dictated um the, the book to Dorothy Collins. So, um, yeah, and the man's a genius. And for me, you know, it, 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 it comes down to, I've, I've talked before, many, you know, I, one of the things I'm always talking about is these five metaphysical uh, um, um, senses. But this is Chesterton par excellence. Uh, uh, and in essence, you know, he, he has humility. And as a consequence of his humility, he has a sense of gratitude. And because of this sense of gratitude, his eyes are open in wonder. And because he's looking at everything with eyes wide open in wonder, he's moved to natural contemplation. And then the consequence of that with a genius like Chesterton this, is this dilatatio, this dilation of the mind and soul to the fullness of God's presence and truth. And then because he's a great writer and a great communicator, he can then communicate that to us. And I think that's the secret of this book. Might I add, as someone who's not a Chesterton scholar, it, isn't it safe to say he was also an artist? It, he yeah. went to art school, and he um, uh, was, you know, was a bit of a cartoonist, right, an illustrator, and things like that. But um, those aspects that you just described, Joseph, you know, the, the the humility, the gratitude, the openness to creation, and all that. I mean. There's a category of person that, you know, the mystic, the artist, the poet, the, you know, there's the, a sense. The mother. There's a sensitivity okay. here. Oh, you're very sweet. Uh, of, course he, you. of course, he didn't Not mean me. You. No. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I include you. You're a mother. But yeah. I mean, mothers have wisdom. Well, well, and you know what I would say? The reason why that ought to go together and maybe doesn't always, but ought to is because being a mother necess necessitates a receptivity. You you have to have a receptivity in order to even become a mother. 
And I would say that these other like categories, poet, mystic, artist, you know, there's a re- they have like antenna up and they're receiving. And I would put Chesterton in that family of types, if you will, that uh, anyway, that's my yeah, observation. Agree, there's two things. All of that's absolutely true. The, the receptivity, but the absolute genius of Chesterton in communicating what he's yes. received. Uh, with, you know, with the power of the word, and and that, that he he's a genius. Uh, the way he uses yeah. paradox and alliteration. I mean, he the beauty of the language, um, the beauty of the logos. I mean, it just just manifests it in his work. Well, you know, even this word genius, having to do with uh, an inspiration from a spiritual realm, the root word of genius has to do with the spiritual phenomenon, and. Think about that for a minute. You know, think about all the geniuses, Einstein and Mozart and all these people. I mean, these are people with huge receptors. Absolutely. And because of this humility and wonder and gratitude, uh, it's not something which is for one particular thing or something else. It's a spirit by which He's grateful for a piece of cheese, for, for, for a length of string, for, uh, you know, a flower on, the, you know, in the garden or anything. And his essays, he actually wrote an essay on, on cheese, right? On a piece of cheese. And, yes. on a, you know, he, he has his pockets and writes an essay. Oh, I got a thumbtack in there. and I got a you know, piece of string in there, a rubber band. And everything he sees has something to be grateful for. Beautiful. And, per- and personally, as regards my own conversion, I always say that under grace, Chester was the single most uh, important influence upon my conversion. And one of the most important things about it, long before I became a Christian per se, was I loved the fact that Chesterton was in love with reality. You know, this sense of gratitude for the small things uh, was made manifest with him such eloquence and elegance and beauty that I just fell in love with the way that he saw the world. And I and I and I tuned myself to that you know and that, and that was part of my conversion long before i really started thinking about christ per se yes you fall in love with someone who's in love you know yeah. uh yeah. There, there's a, a, a winsomeness to that and i too he was critical in my conversion as well i was already a believer in christ but i had no idea what i was supposed to do with that and so i began going in and out of churches and in and out of Christian bookshops. And I, you know, and I bumped into Chesterton in a Christian bookshop. It was an evangel owned by an evangelical Christian. And they had Chesterton on the same shelf with C.S. Lewis. So I just took orthodoxy and Lewis's mere Christianity and you rest want, is history. Want, rest is history, want, as they say. You were on the right yeah. track, you know. Yeah. I, I, also, I, I, because of this right. This gratitude that he has generally, he seems to love his enemies. Yeah, that is, he sees good everywhere, even in in what's evil or what's what's contrary to what he thinks. And as you, you know, you've said many times, Joseph, is to base it on Bernard Shaw, whatever, uh, or or the atheists. I mean, they were friends. They got together and everything. And even this book, I mean, this book comes after his first book was called Heretics. You know, he, he criticized these heresies and. Of course, we'll see here. Someone said, "Well, I want to hear what your philosophy is." You know, so he writes his book, but basically, he he sympathetically will understand and write about those who he disagrees with. Yeah, and that's why I mean, H. G. Wells, who I think, as far as I'm aware, was an atheist until the time they died, said that if I have, if I get to heaven, it will be because of, because of the prayers of my good friend G. K. Chesterton. Oh. <laughs> You know, and that's just yeah, and and they were and they were intellectual enemies. I mean, Ch- Chester's book, The Everlasting Man, was written as a response to H.G. Wells's errors. But they're, they're the two men remain friends. That's beautiful. All right, Joseph, what's next? Okay, well let, let's 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 dive in then, and let, let's let's begin with the preface then on page nine. Um, and um, you know, I, I don't know if we need to read the whole thing, but um. As you as you alluded to, Father, that the, the inspiration for this book of orthodoxy was that he Chester wrote a book called Heretics, where he basically took um, uh, some of his contemporaries um, uh, and um, ex- basically explained why they were wrong in their fundamental worldview, so this, including people such as George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells. So um, we got here many critics 
complain of the book called Heretics because it merely criticized current philosophies without offering any alternative philosophy. This book is an attempt to answer the challenge. And then he alludes below that to Newman's Apologia. Uh, and of course, Newman's Apologia was actually written by Newman following his conversion to Catholicism. Uh, Chesterton is somewhat jumping the gun here because he's not actually uh, come to any ultimate conclusion as regards uh, the church. Um, but I think we know from reading this book that he knows that Newman is right in his Apologia. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that it's, it's, it's there. Uh, and, and the idea is, of course, this is not only apologetics, this book, not only an apologetics, but it is an Apologia, right? It is an autobiographical explanation by Chesterton, because this is a very autobiographical book. It's Chesterton's own intellectual journey. So it, in, it, there is a parallel with Newman's Apologia in the sense that, that Chesterton's explaining how he came to orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love this line right here. Uh, it's an explanation not of whether the Christian faith can be believed, but of how he, meaning Chesterton, personally has come to believe it. Very good. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we can talk about the note of the text. Let's go to, let's go to chapter one then. Uh, introduction in defense of everything else. And although, Father, you've asked me to lead it, and I'm honored to do so, uh, you know, I've got so many things highlighted here. <laughs> Maybe I could defer to one of you to, to, to commence the conversation. Well, I love this. Remember I mentioned the artist uh, element to him. And the end of the first paragraph, he says, I have attempted in a vague and personal way in a set of mental pictures rather than in a series of deductions to state the philosophy in which I have come to believe. I will not call it my philosophy for I did not make it. God and humanity made it and it made me. But this mental pictures approach, you know, is, um, well, it's helpful to a lot of people because uh, a lot of us are operating not so much on a high intellectual plane or as academics or as scholars, but, you know, we need help. We are all experiencing reality and we need help interpreting it. And Chesterton is a genius at seeing it for what it is and interpreting it in such a winsome way that you're like, aha, that's right. I do want to yeah. go back to the very first sentence, the first two sentences, as an example of Chesterton's you know, commonly, you know, very frequent, humorous self-deprecation. His first sentence, the only possible excuse for this book is that it's an answer to a challenge. Even a bad shot is dignified when he accepts a duel. <laughs> yeah, and this is very chess, very chivalrous, very sort of living in the, the aesthetic of the, of the romanticized mid Middle Ages. I mean, he wrote a whole book with the ball and the cross, which is about an atheist. And, uh, and a Catholic trying to trying to fight a duel. So this is very Chesterton. Well, and again, dueling, and again, sorry. dueling, by the way, is a very important part of American history. It's not just something from the Middle Ages. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. But, 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 but I think the Americans, the Americans, they, they were part of the old world in those old days, and uh, they, they were they were grafting, uh, should we say, medieval practices onto their own culture. Um, but the one thing I want to say about that first paragraph before we do move on is that this is the key thing when he says, I will not call it my philosophy, for I did not make it. Mm -hmm. God and humanity made it, and it made me. So the most important thing right from the very beginning is, is establishing that reality and truth is something objective, something which I don't make, that it's not about you know my uh, making my own reality. I have to conform myself to whatever it is that's out there. It's about objectivity, not subjectivity. Even though this is a very subjective in the sense it's autobiographical. The quest is to get beyond the self, to understand the self in relationship to a reality that's greater. Right. Father? Well, yes. The beginning of the next paragraph on the first page, I think is important because he's used this image before, and it does, it does in a sense, uh, encapsulate his, his whole spirit of wonder. He says, I've often had the fa a fancy for writing a romance about an English Scotsman who slightly miscalculated his course and discovered England under the impression 
It was a new island in the South Seas. But it's, it, he, he has a way of looking at old things through new eyes. And so we get habituated to all the things that God has put in the world. And, and, but he, oh, he overcomes for us that habituation by allowing us to see things mm -hmm. in a different way, you know. Yeah, and even the familiar, we have to learn to see to see to be startled by the you know, by the familiar, you know, it, 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 with wonder, not take things for granted. I mean, for me, a, a key thing for me lately, I walk down to the creek every morning here. So when you know, get to an old man, you, you you become a creature of habit, you know. And I always think to myself, walking down there, I don't know what I'm going to see in terms of nature that particular morning. But you no, know, if 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 you want to see, you have to look. Right, and that's the whole point. I know Chester is really saying here is that you know, even the familiar mm -hmm. things can be startling if you approach them from the perspective of humility, gratitude, and wonder. How many books have you written on Chester? One or more? I've only written one book on Chester. He, he's, I, I, I suspect he's mentioned every single one, every single book I've ever, I've ever written. <laughs> but I've only, I've only written the biography of him. I, I, I want to write a book with the challenge of Chesterton, looking at his ideas. But I, it's a question of time. So your book is The Wit and Wisdom of G.K. Chesterton? Like it's uh, wisdom, wisdom and Innocence, A Life of G.K. Chesterton, my first ever book as a Catholic, which uh, Ignatius Press published right back in 1997, when you and I were young, Father. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> young I, I, was, anyway. I was already old. Okay. <laughs> Younger. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that, um, picking up from that theme on the next page, in the middle of the first paragraph, how can we contrive to be at once astonished at the world and yet at home in it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So overcoming this familiarity, and there is this expression, familiarity breeds contempt. Yes. Right? How, how can we overcome that tendency? Well, that's a good question. How can we? I hope, I think he's going to set out to try to help us. Yeah, without, what I, what I, what I, what, sorry, Father, please. Without thinking that, it has to be something exotic or unusual or uh, exceptional. No, the key is to be astonished and yet at home. Correct, at and the same to, time. To take the homely, homey, familiar things and be astonished by them. Yes. That's his genius. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. I've got, I've got the paragraph in, 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 in the Margie beside that paradox, wonder in familiarity. Right. So don't don't treat the familiar um, with con with contempt or with indifference or or to be blind to it. You're just not even seeing it any longer because it's there all the time. And so this is what a child is like. And what does Jesus say that we have to become like children? I mean, children are always exhibiting this wonder. You know, you give a child a gift, and they open it up and they see what it is, and they play with the box. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're they're fascinated by the box. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Yeah, but I still remember those Christmas mornings when I was very young. I mean, the sense of wonder. It was like walking through a wardrobe, you know, into Wonderland because Christmas morning with the gifts and everything about the magic of the of the moment. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's childlike, and somehow or other we have to try to keep that alive. Keep that alive. Yeah. <laughs> So I, want to, again, I want to quote this Sorry. one at, at, yeah. on page 14 still, again, because this is ex exemplary of representative of something which is uh, throughout his work, but four lines in that paragraph, I wish to set forth my faith as particularly answering this double spiritual need, the need for that mixture of the familiar and the unfamiliar, which Christendom has rightly named romance. So that's interesting for and what is romance? Mm -hmm. Romance is showing the astonishing character of something which is familiar. Yeah, it's funny though. I mean, Lewis um, begins, uh, um, I think, the second edition of his book, The Pilgrim's Regress, um, by basically saying that romance now has so many meanings, it's become meaningless. Um, so, uh, uh, but again, I disagree with him there because uh, he also wrote a book called The Four Loves. Um, so, you know, the fact that something is has various meanings doesn't mean we shouldn't define it. Um, the other thing at the end of this chapter, by the way, we can go back again, but I want to make sure we say this because this is there's a parallel between this and uh, Lewis's mere Christianity. Because what Lewis is trying to do in mere Christianity is look at the highest common factor 
that unites uh, different denominations that are that are orthodox because they have this highest common factor, not the ecumenism of lowest common denominator. Um, uh, so here, Cheston does it by saying, "Well, what 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 is it that that, that I'm calling orthodox here?" Because he's not yet a, a, a defined Catholic, a definite Catholic. So he takes, and this is page 17, the Apostles' Creed, right? He's basically going to say the Apostles' Creed uh, is the, 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 the delineates what orthodoxy is, and this is what he's going to be defending. So in, in this, of course, he can take Anglicans with him, uh, he can take Catholics with him, he can take many non-denominational, non-conformist uh, Protestants with him. So uh, he's, he's, he's trying to gather the flock and say, what is it that we believe as Christians? Mm -hmm. uh, on page 16, just before the new paragraph there, this is another one of his kind of paradoxical humor statements, because he was trying to found his own, or think through his own vision of the world, his own philosophy of life. And he said, I did try to found a heresy of my own. When I put the last touches to it, I discovered there was orthodoxy. <laughs> well, again, sure. he does it, just before that, he returns to the, to, to the metaphor of the yachtsman. You know, mm -hmm. he's traveled all, all around the world looking at all the different philosophers, uh, all the different philosophies, trying to understand what the truth is. And then when he actually uh, lands his yacht, he realizes he's actually back home uh, with, with Christianity, with, with orthodoxy. Joseph, can you enlighten us on this unusual title? I mean, both I mean, great authors, I think, have an ability to have a, a real point they make in a chapter and to somehow express that briefly in a chapter heading. But here is an introduction in defense of everything else. What does it mean everything else? <laughs> yeah, I know. But again, I, 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 that's, I mean, I'm not sure that I'm going to answer that in a capsulating way. I probably should. I've read this many times, well, as indeed so have you, Father. But I, 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 I think basically that what he's saying is that I want to affirm the goodness of it. <laughs> in other well, words, on, the, good, the, good, the goodness of reality. At the bottom, he does say, you know, here's a hint, about seven lines up. The thing I do not propose to prove. So here's what he's not going to defend, right? The thing I propose to take as common ground between any, myself and average reader. So he's not going to defend this, but rather everything else. Uh, is that this desirability of an active and imaginative life, picturesque and full of potential curiosity. You know, a life such as Western man at any rate is always seem to desire. So I... He's not going to try and defend that. If, if you don't have that sense of, uh, you know, the desire to have an active, adventurous, imaginative life, well, then, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to try and defend that. If you don't accept that, well, you want to buy another right. book, maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, it's like the one person he refused to debate was um, Alistair Crowley, you know, the Satanist. I mean, there's a point at which Chester says, well, if you don't at least accept that goodness is good, that truth is true, that the beautiful is beautiful, there's no point talking to you. So there's a point at which cynicism becomes um, poisonous, and at that point you can't engage in terms of let's try to get at a truth because the other person does not believe in truth per se except to pervert it. So he refused to talk to, 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 talk to Alistair Crowley, the, the, the Satanist, because, well, what is there to say? Right? What, what Crowley needs is an exorcist. Not, not, not some of the reason with him. You know, there's, there's that expression, I'm not going to defend the indefensible. What Chesterton is doing is, I'm not going to defend the thing that ought not to have any defense, because it's the basis for your life and your sanity and everything else. I'm right. going to defend these less obvious things for you. But the one thing I'm not going to defend is the thing that we have to accept as a given, which, as you just pointed out, is that there is a truth of things, that there is a ground of being, that there is a shared human aspiration experience and so on. That's funny though. He kind of is doing the exact opposite of, I don't know, what what anyone else would say. <laughs> Except that I think the genius here is, he doesn't actually say, I'm not gonna defend the desire for truth, seeking after objective reality. He's gonna say, if you're boring and think life is boring, and don't even want an adventure. Well, I'm not for you. He's saying, 
I want okay. I want to accept as a basis that we all want to find something exciting about what we're doing in a familiar way. But if you don't want that, well then, you know, I I can't. I'm not going to defend it. I'm going to defend yeah, something the, else. The, the analogy I'm thinking of here, Father, is the um, the beginning of uh, the Hobbit. You know where, where where Bilbo Baggins is not interested in leaving his Hobbit hole because that's where all of his possessions are and his comfort is, and the last thing he wants is an adventure. And Gandalf, yeah. said, well, that's why you need the adventure. You have to leave your Hobbit hole. You have to go out and find something bigger than this little self self contained, you know, uh, subjective existence you have for yourself. You've got to, the adventure of life is what you have to pursue. I think we've uh, pretty much run the end of our. Uh time here so that's a good we can start with chapter two next time mm -hmm. thank you everyone god bless you if you enjoyed this discussion please help spread the word about the forum book club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review you can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com